Well, I'd like to invite you this morning to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. That's where we'll be today. 1 Corinthians, as I continue on with our series entitled Troubled and Triumphant. Troubled and Triumphant. And the reason I've given the series this title is because that's exactly what we learn about the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth was in trouble. As you'll hear this morning, they were in trouble. But Paul was writing to encourage them that in the midst of their trouble, they could be triumphant if they handled conflict the right way. So that should be a word of encouragement for you today. All of us, we, we, have, we, we encounter various trials. We encounter various forms of conflict. Some of you right now, you are experiencing trouble in your life. And I want you to know that if you'll handle it the, the right way, in a way that honors God, that you can be actually be triumphant in the midst of your trouble. And so that's what we're going to see today. The subtitle for this morning's message is Exposing Carnal Christianity. Exposing Carnal Christianity. And so I would like for us to begin reading there in chapter 3. And again, we're going to look at the whole chapter. But this morning, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 to begin with, all right? So let's look there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let's read verses 1 through 4, and then we'll address the, other, uh, the rest of the, the chapter as we make our way through this message. So let's read. Paul says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ, I fed you with milk and not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For, one, or for, when, one, for when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human. Well, years ago, before I entered the ministry, some of you know I, I worked on an offshore oil rig and uh, off the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico. And one of the things you need to know about those rigs is that the, the rig floor where you do all your dr the, the connecting the pipe for the drilling of natural gas and oil, that can get pretty nasty. I mean, you have a lot of uh, uh, that rig floor can get pretty nasty. But underneath the rig, when you go down into the hole of the rig, it was clean all the time. You see, in the hole, you had, what, you had the motor room, you had the pump room, and you had the room where all the different variety of tools were kept. Now, every now and then, we would have to go down into the hole of the rig, and we would have to clean those rooms. Now, our tool pusher, that's the boss, he would always say to us, make sure there's nothing left in the corners of these rooms. So you would walk into these rooms and there would be nothing in the corner. Everything would have its place, put on a shelf, hanging on, on the wall, but nothing in the corner. Why was that? Why didn't he want anything in the corner? Because he believed that once you started putting things in the corner, it wouldn't be long before it just filled over into the room. Now, think about that in your own life. Parents, think about your children's bedroom. Or maybe even your own bedroom. I know in times past, when I've told my kids to clean the room, you know what they would do? They would take everything that was in the middle of the floor and shove it to the corners. Now, I want you to think about it in reality. If you leave the corners a mess, it won't be long before the whole room's a mess. Now, let's apply that to the Christian life. I believe that there are a lot of Christians, I think we're all guilty at times, where, for the most part, we, we seek to live our lives pretty clean. Except for the corners. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. About those messy corners in your life. 
that if you, if you allow those corners to stay messy, it won't be long before you're leaving or living a life of carnality, a life of worldliness. Unkept corners will lead to a messy room. And that has been the fall of many Christians. It's like the Christian contemporary song. Um, I don't know who sing it, sings it, but it's a slow fade when you give your heart away. It doesn't just happen all at once. It's a slow fade. Eventually, over time, you begin to give your heart away to little things. And before you know it, you're living a life of carnality. You're backslidden. Where does all that begin? It all begins with a failure to keep the corner of your life clean. What does this involve? It involves searching your heart. Oh yes, you know those things that are easy for you to confess. You have things in your life just like I do. They're, they're easy to confess. They're obvious. Lord, forgive me for the way I reacted to that situation. Uh, that wasn't the right way. And so we confess those things. But what about those things in the deep rest, recesses of your heart? That you really don't want anybody messing with. Those things that your flesh really longs for. And perhaps they've been there for so long that you've even justified them as being right in your own mind. Even though the Holy Spirit continues to subtly, subtly, subtly convict you. Well, this is what's happened to the church at Corinth. These believers failed to keep the corners of their life clean. And as a result, it overflowed into their heart. And now, they are living a life of carnality, a life of flesh. Look at what he says. But I, brothers, I love the word brothers because immediately Paul tells us who he's talking to. He's not talking to non-church members. He's not talking to lost people. How does he refer to these people? He refers to them as brothers and, and as sisters, right? So he's talking to other Christians. He says, but I, brothers, notice what he said, I could not address you as spiritual people. Who are the spiritual people? Those are the mature. Those are the godly. Those are the ones who are growing in their faith. He says, I want, to, I want to address you as mature Christians, but I cannot. He says, but I, I, I have to address you as people of the flesh. Fleshly. Worldly. And then he goes on to say, just to make sure you understand what I mean by the word flesh, I have to address you as infants. Some of them are infants because they're new believers. And we don't expect a new believer to behave like a mature Christian. But the context here is he's addressing people who ought to be mature in their faith, but they still act like infants. And we know that, once again, that he's talking about Christians, because notice what he says. But as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. He says in verse 2, I fed you with milk, not solid food. Now, there's a time when Christians need milk, especially a new convert. There's a time when they need milk. But there's a time to... Not only do you, not only do you need the milk, you also need the solid food. You know, some people think that you get to a point where your Christianity, you don't need the milk anymore, you just need solid food. The thing you need to understand, that the milk and the solid food is the same thing. It's just the depth of your understanding that makes it different. The gospel is the milk and the gospel is the solid food. 
Are you getting it? He's saying, you don't need something new. He says, you're still on the surface level of your understanding. But, you, but, but what I want to do is I want to take you deeper into these truths. I want to take you deeper, but I cannot because you're still fleshly. In other words, your spiritual growth has derailed somewhere. What about you? How long have you been a Christian? How long have you been a Christian? How are you growing? How are you maturing? Look at your life. Has your spiritual growth derailed somewhere along the way? Because it has for these believers. He says, I fed you with milk and not solid food. Why? For you were not ready for it. Even now, in other words, you ought to be ready for it by now, but even now you're still not ready. Your faith, your spiritual development has derailed along the way. Verse 3, for you are still of the flesh. He's saying to these Christians, you ought to be growing in your faith, but you are still living a worldly life. And then he tells us what's that, what that looks like. Look at, again, verse 3. For you are still of the flesh. Here's what it looks like. For, there, for while there is still what? Jealousy and strife among you. And then he asks the question, are you not of the flesh? Notice he's going to ask three questions here that really get to the heart of the issue. The first question is this. There is jealousy and strife among you. Are you not of the flesh? Does this, not, does this not prove that you are of the flesh? It's a rhetorical question because the answer is obvious. What's the answer? Yes. There is strife and jealousy among you. There is di division among you. Are you not of the flesh? Yes, Indeed you are. The answer is obvious. He goes on to say, and you're behaving only in a human way. You ought to be behaving spiritually, but you're behaving fleshly. Now good, look at another question. Look here, verse 4. For one says, I follow Paul. And another, I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? Another probing question with an obvious answer. Here you are picking sides. Here you are pitting teachers against one another. You've got your own cliques. Some of you say, well, I follow Paul. Others say, well, I follow Apollos. When you do this, are you not being human? Are you not behaving in the flesh? Then he asks a third question. Verse 5. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Again, a probing question that gets to the heart of the issue. Now, why is Paul asking these probing questions? Because they have vices in their heart. And Paul's agenda is to expose these vices. These corners that haven't been clean. So this morning, I'm going to talk to you about three ways that these vices manifest themselves. Okay? So if you want to know whether or not you're living a carnal life, a worldly life, a fleshly life, then you need to evaluate your life based upon these three vices that I'm about to share with you that come right from the text. The first vice is misplaced focus. Misplaced focus. Look at the text. He says, verse 5, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Diakone is the Greek word, translated servants. We're servants. Paul says, listen, you're putting all this emphasis upon man. You're putting all this emphasis upon pa Apollos, and you're putting all this emphasis upon Paul, and you're pitting the two against one another, and he says, 
We're servants. That's who we are. We are servants. Look at what he goes on to say. Through whom you believed. But notice where he puts the emphasis. As the Lord assigned to each. We are servants. You believe because of the Lord. We are assigned by the Lord and you have believed because of the Lord. Look at what he says. Verse 6. I, pla- I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. The growth. Notice the possessives here. Who's in possession of this? God is. He's saying, I planted because Paul planted the church. But notice that Paul does not trump Trump himself. Notice that Paul does not seek honor for himself. Even though Paul started the church, he places Apollos on the same ground. Do you see that? He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God's the one who gave the growth. Don't look to Paul. Don't look to Apollos. This is what he's saying. Look to God. Are you getting this, church? Look at what he says in verse 7. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his wage according to his labor. For we are God's fellow worker. You are God's field. You are God's building. Again, a vice in the heart will manifest itself through a misplaced focus. Who do you place your focus upon? We've all heard stories after stories after stories of people who are no longer, people who profess to know Christ, but who are no longer a part of the church. No longer a part of the church. As a matter of fact, they don't want to have anything to do with the church. And if you ask them, why is that? Why don't you go to church? Why don't you have anything to do with the church? And their answer is always what? Because there are hypocrites in the church. Or one time in the church, this happened. Or I just don't like the pastor. Right? They always point it back to someone. That's a misplaced focus. Listen, I'm glad, I love you and I'm glad that you love me, but I'm not to be the focus of your attention. If you base your faithfulness to God on me, it won't be long before you're living a life of carnality. I believe that the servants of God ought to be shown gratitude. I believe that the scripture teaches that we ought to honor those who labor among us. But I'm not to be your focus. To be quite honest, I'm not a perfect man. And there'll be times that I'll let you down. Not intentionally, but it'll happen. But if your focus is on me, and when you feel like I failed you or have let you down, you know what you're going to do? You're going to vacate the premises. And then you're going to go to another church, and guess what? It's going to happen again. You're going to vacate the premises. The next thing you know, you're a church hopper. You go to church, but you don't belong to church. The Lord doesn't want you going to church. He wants you, oh, what is that? What are you saying? Listen, he doesn't want you going to church. He wants you belonging to a church. And there's a difference. God, listen, God must be the focus of your attention. Some of you right now are, are struggling in, with someone in your life. Someone's let you down. Someone's betrayed you. Someone's lied to you. Whatever it may be. And your life just feels like it's falling apart. Just falling apart. You're depressed. You're overly anxious. You're full of worry because someone has let you down. You've kind of withdrawn from God. Do you understand that that represents a corner that has not been cleaned out? 
all, all that does is manifest that your focus has been misplaced. If you focus on people to determine how you feel, if you focus on people to determine how well you serve God, if you focus on people to determine how close you walk with God, you will live a life of carnality, a life of the flesh, a life of worldliness. But we have to come to the realization that people will fail us, people will let us down, people will hurt us, but God never will. God never will. So if you have a misplaced focus, then you have a vice in your heart that will ultimately lead to carnality if you don't deal with it. Oh, they were looking to Paul, they were looking to Apollos, and says, listen, we're servants of the Lord. God's the one who gives the growth. You focus on God. Notice what else he does. Verse 10, he says, according to the grace of God, who's he, given, who's he putting the focus on again? Look at verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, Paul says, I am who I am by the grace of God. He says, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And someone else is building upon it. He doesn't even say who it is. He's saying to the Corinthian church, listen, I laid the foundation for the church. Someone else is building upon it. Why doesn't he say who it is? Because it doesn't matter. The, the focus is to be on God. Someone else is building on it. But let, look at what he says. But each, let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though himself will be saved, but only as through the fire. Notice what Paul does here. First of all, he puts their focus back on God. Take it away from man, put your focus on God. And then, in verses 5 through 9, he argues that all servants belong to the Lord. They all have different tasks, but their tasks come from God. And God's the one who blesses with the growth. But now we come to verses 10 through 15. So in one picture, Paul says, listen, Apollos and I, we're just farmhands. <laughs> You're the field. We're just the farmhands. God's the owner. And now he's going to change the metaphor from a farm or from a field to a building. We see that in verses 10 through 15. He changes the image to a building in which God becomes the one who lets out the contract, employs the building inspector to ensure that the, the construction is done correctly and without fraud. So God is the one who has established the contract. God is the one who has hired the, the building inspector. And he's going to inspect each builder's work. To see whether or not they built with faithful material. So here's what Paul's saying. Listen, we're just God's farmhands. But not only that, we're just God's builders. God owns the farm. God owns the building. We're here working. And one day we're going to have to stand before God and we're going to have to give an account for how we've built. Apollos is going to have to give an account. I, Paul, will have to give an account. Blake Gideon will have to give an account. We're going to have to give an account of how we've built upon this foundation. And, and there's only one way to build upon it, and, and, that's through, and that's to preach Jesus Christ. And one day we stand before God, and we're going to have to give an account. And if our work, if we've built with good material, if we have built with good material, there's going to be a reward. 
But if we've built with wood, hay, and stubble, which is what a lot of preaching is out there today, if we've built with wood, hay, and stubble, we will have to give an account for God. Because God not only owns the farm, God not only owns the building, and he's the inspector, he's the final judge. So once again, what's he saying? Your focus must be on God, not on man. The second thing, if you have a vice in your heart, you're going to have a misplaced focus. Number two, you're going to have a misplaced identity. A misplaced identity. Look at what he says. Go back to your Bibles. Look at what he says in the latter part of verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. Look at what he says. You are God's field. You are God's building. Paul says we're just servants in the field. We're just servants working on the building. But notice what he reminds them of. You are God's field. You are God's building. This is your identity. This is who you are. And so the judgment... On the last day that he talks about here, verse 13, look there. Each one's work will become manifest for the day when God will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Each one will be judged according to what he or she has done. Verse 14, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though himself he'll be saved, but only as through the fire. So not only do preachers have a responsibility to build up and to edify the church, all Christians have a responsibility to build up and to edify the church. Why? Because of your identity. You are God's field. You are God's building. And if you lose sight of that, if you lose sight of who you are in Christ, if you lose sight of your true identity, then you're going to fail to live up to the standard that God has called you to. What does that look like again? Have you ever met Christians out in the community who talk negative about the church? Well, I just don't, you know, I, I just don't go to church. Bunch of hypocrites up there. Or the, or, or the self appointed Siskel and Eberts, you know, the movie critics. Those who leave church and they're like, well, that was a thumbs down. Well, I give it a thumbs up. The, the music was a thumbs up, but the preaching was a thumbs down, or the preaching was a thumbs up. And, the, and so, right? How does that edify the church? How does that build up the church? How does talking negative about the church and the community edify the church? How does that build up the church? It doesn't. Listen, you are God's field. You are God's building. That's your identity. He's going to tell us here in a moment, you're God's temple. Well, let's go ahead and look at it. This is still a part of your identity. Look at what he says. So he's used the metaphor of a farm or a field, the metaphor of a building, and now notice the third one, a temple. In chapter 6, he's going to make it personal, and he's going to say that each Christian is the temple. But right here, he says the church as a whole is the temple. Look at verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So what is your identity? You are a God's field, you are God's building, you are God's temple. So what's God require of you? Because this is your identity. You're to labor in the field, you're to build up the, the building, and you're to help to keep the temple clean. So I ask you a question. What are you personally doing to build up and to edify the church? Because you have a responsibility not just to go to church, but to belong to a church. Stop asking people where they go. Where do you go to church? 
start asking them what church do they belong to. Because when you belong to a church, you invest into that ministry. You seek to encourage and to build up that. Why? Because it's your church. It's where you belong. It's where you serve. It's where you get involved. It's where you're fed. So, a misplaced focus will lead to a carnal life. A misplaced identity will lead to a carnal life. So many Christians forget they're Christians. So many Christians forget that they're to be growing in spiritual maturity. They lose sight of their identity and they look more like the world than they do the church. They look more like the world than they do Christ. What do the corners of your life look like? Is it clutter? All the rooms clean. Oh God, come here. God, God, come here and look at my room. Look how clean it is. And really nothing's really that clean. It's just been pushed to the corners. What have we seen here? God gives the increase. God's the one who builds up the church. And we're not to destroy it. We're not to be the ones who bring division and disunity into the church. We see a misplaced focus. We see a misplaced identity. And thirdly, we see misplaced priorities. It's not only a misplaced priority, it's also a misplaced perspective. Their whole view of it's wrong. Do you understand that your whole view of the church and your whole view of life will be wrong if you have a misplaced focus? If you fail to live up to who you're supposed to be in Christ? That your perspective on life is just going to be warped? And your priorities are going to be misplaced? I can give you story after story after story of Christians who were once walking well with the Lord but lost sight of who they were. I can remember one couple in the first church where I pastored. Man, they were involved. They were coming to Sunday school. They were there for every service. They were seeking to serve the Lord. They were growing together as a family. They were raising their children up in the church. But they decided they wanted to build a new home. And they wanted to build it as cheap as they could. And so they started taking Sundays off because Sunday was the only day they could work on their new home. And I went to them and I warned them. I said, don't do this. Oh, pastor, it's only for a little while. We have to do this, but we'll be back in church as soon as it's over. I think I've shared this story in this church before. They only lived in that new house a few months before they were divorced. Why? It's a slow fade when you give your heart away. The room's not clean if you leave clutter in the corner. And if you do, it won't be long before you give your life, your life is given over to carnality. You see, they had a a misplaced focus. Their focus no longer was on God. Their focus was now on, we got to get this house built. And as a result of that, they had a misplaced identity. They forgot that, no, God's to be first. We belong to God. We're God's field. We're God's building. We're God's children. We're God's temple. God's to be first. We're to honor, we're to edify God with our bodies. We are to honor and to edify His church. God's going to be first. His church is going to be, uh, His church is going to be first because we belong to that church. That's our identity, but they lost sight of their focus. They lost sight of their identity. And guess what? Their whole perspective in life began to change. Their priorities changed. And the way they begin to look at each other and the way they begin to treat each other changed until it fell apart. Until it fell apart. 
I know of a pastor who lost his ministry because he had a moral failure. He was trying to, later on in life, as he was getting older in age, he was invited to speak at the seminary. Some of you would say, well, why in the world would they have this guy come speak at the seminary to a bunch of young seminary students if he had a moral failure? In order to keep these young seminary preachers from having the same mistake. He said this. This is how it all started for him. He said, I begin to, my moral failure began with a slow fade. He didn't use those exact words, but that's it. He says, I stopped having my daily quiet time with the Lord. Misplaced focus. Number two, I began to look at things I shouldn't look at. Misplaced identity. And then I begin to give my attention to things that were contrary to the will of God, misplaced priorities. And then a misplaced perspective, because then he began to justify what he was doing. And his life crumbled apart, and he lost his ministry. A life of carnality. Both examples, lives of carnality. What about you? Are you living a carnal life? A fleshly life? You say, Pastor, are you calling us to lead a life of perfection? Listen, I, I, I truly don't believe that we'll ever be perfect this side of heaven. Now, positionally we are because we're in Christ. But practically, we still need to confess sin on a daily basis. I understand that we are going to still be tempted with sin. And there are going to be times when we fail and we give in. That is why it is vitally important that we live a lifestyle of daily confession and repentance. But I think that for the most part, we've gotten to a place in our life where as long as the, as long as the floor is clean, it doesn't matter what the corners look like. And I'm saying to you, if the corners aren't clean, it won't be long before the room's a mess. Look at your focus. Remember your identity. Keep your priorities in the right order. He says, let no one deceive you, verse 18. If anyone among you thinks he's wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Let no one boast in men. For all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, all the world, or life or death, or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ. And Christ is God's. He's saying, listen. All these people that you're focusing on, they're just servants of the Lord. All the pettiness. He's rebuking them for being petty. He's rebuking them for being prideful. Oh, you think you're wise, but in reality, you need to become a fool. You're worried about all this other stuff, but you don't realize that you belong to God, and all that He has is yours. Two things you need to be on guard against. You need to be on guard against pride because the pride will keep you from having a teachable spirit. And you need to be on guard against giving yourself over to petty things that don't really matter. Pride and pettiness. Now, there's good news. <laughs> because the reality is, is that for some of you, the Lord probably hit you right square between the eyes this morning. And 
And you say, man, my focus has been off. My focus has been misplaced. My life has just been consumed with petty things. I've allowed myself to be overcome by petty things. I've allowed petty things to take up my, all my time and my energy and my focus and my thoughts. I've been petty. I've been prideful because I haven't been teachable. My focus has been off. My identity's been off. My priorities have been misplaced. Here's the good news. Is that you can start fresh today. Start today. Start today getting your focus back where it needs to be. Start today reminding yourself of who you are in Christ and that you should live up to that. Remind yourself that that the, that the Lord should be first, that, that He should be your priority, that He should be the, the focus of your mind's attention and your heart's affection. Some practical advice. How about start a reading plan today? Start a reading plan. Oh, there are tons of reading plans out there to read through the Bible in a year. Start a reading plan. I do a reading plan every year. I'm in the middle of a reading plan right now. And God gives me what I need to hear through that reading plan. I have found that when I'm consistently in God's Word, making my way through that reading plan, God ministers to my very needs, sometimes when I don't even expect it. You want to have your focus in the right place? Start a daily Bible reading plan today. Start keeping a prayer journal. I do that. I write out my prayers in a journal. You know why? Because it helps me to focus my attention on what I'm praying for. It keeps my mind from wandering. So I do my daily Bible reading plan. I keep a prayer journal. And I seek to do everything that I can to build up His church. Isn't that the word for today? You want your focus to be right? You want to live up to your identity? You want your priorities to be in the right place? Then listen, start a Bible reading plan, keep a prayer journal, and seek to do everything that you can to build up His church, to build up other believers who are around you. This will help you keep the corners clean so that you do not give over to a life of carnality and fleshliness. I'd like for you to bow with me this morning in prayer. And as, we're, as you're sitting there, we're not praying yet. I just want you to contemplate. All right? This is a time of meditation. So everyone, just bow your head. Find your quiet place. And I want you to ask yourself, or ask God to show you, God, what's in my corners? Lord, I've thought I've cleaned the room, but in reality, there's clutter in, in the corner of my life. It could be an improper attitude, improper relationship. improper handling of your money. It could be unforgiveness. It could be bitterness. It could be an addiction. It could be pornography. It could be fear. Doubt. What is it? What's that thing that God's asking you to give up? But yet, you keep hanging on to it. You've even justified it in your own mind. Listen to me. 
as your pastor who loves you very dearly, you can start fresh today. If you'll just allow the Lord, just just tell him what it is. He already knows. He just wants to make sure you know what it is. You confess it. You tell him what it is. Tell him what it is. What's in that corner? I want you to go over there and grab it right now, spiritually, metaphorically speaking, and I want you to give it to the Lord. Walk over to that corner, whatever it is, and say, God, I'm taking this out of the corner. I know it's wrong, and I'm giving it to you. Oh, God, take it from me. I don't want it anymore. It's keeping me from living for you. I realize that if I don't confess this, if I don't repent of this, if I don't give this to you, it's going to lead to a life of carnality. And Lord, I don't want that. I want to be a strong, spiritually mature Christian. I want to be able to stand before you one day and hear, job well done, my good and and faithful servant. You come. Give that to the Lord. Is it salvation? Maybe you've never truly been saved. Maybe you've never truly surrendered your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Then I'd like to invite you this morning, here in a moment, when I ask everyone to stand, there'll be pastors standing down front. I would like to encourage you just to come forward and and say, "I'm, I'm coming this morning to surrender my life to Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I believe that only Jesus can cleanse me of my sin. I believe that the only life worth living is one lived for Jesus. And I believe that he is God's son who died for me, was buried and rose again. And I'm surrendering my life to him this morning. If that's you, would you come here in a moment and make that decision? Some of you just need a a, a point. A point where, a point of surrender. It's not for salvation, but just a, Maybe you'd come to the altar this morning and just kneel at the altar and whatever it is that's in your corner, you would just leave it here. You understand what I'm saying? Just leave it here. Surrender it to the Lord. Holy Father, I pray that you would reveal to us the vices in our hearts. I pray that we would have a teachable spirit, that we would not hang on to things that are petty, We would not hang on to pride, but that we would surrender these things to you for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you begin to stand now and come as the Lord leads? You come.